Um, good afternoon, everybody. Yep. As uh, Modern said, I'm Zach from Cape Town. Um, I think I'm the only representative from the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, what I've been doing over the last, I mean, six months mainly, but I suppose I'm quite a new user. So I've been working in APL for about two, two and a half years. And some of the changes that I've kind of encountered recently in the way that I'm working and some of the challenges and um, the importance of libraries. Um, so I work for a company called RiskFlow in Johannesburg, um, working remotely from Cape Town. And their, their main game is cash management. So, and we work on, we've got two main products. Um, this is kind of one combined. It's an asset and liability management project, uh, product called Cube360. Um, and it's got an extension called Basel Plus, which handles a whole bunch of regulatory reporting. Um, the other one is FNB Trade, which is a, a treasury system. And then we've got uh, a little app written in Dialog called um, CFO Cash Flow Optimizer. Um, and recently, in the last, I'd say, three months, there's been a major change in the way I've been working. Um, and that's with um, us being able to integrate into those other products from Dialog using DLLs. Um, so before that, I spent a lot of time um, working on prototypes. So I was kind of in charge of proof of concept or prototyping new products, um, or just expanding ideas. But actually having code that was going to go into these systems or in production systems wasn't really my thing at the time. But now with a um, you know, fair amount of fiddling and dealing with uh, ActiveX and all sorts of bits and bobs along the way, we've kind of integrated with um, Cube360 and now FNB Trade the one of which is written in um, APL 2000, another one's written in progress. And what I've discovered, you know, I mean, I really enjoy prototyping, kind of being here is great, but what I've discovered is kind of as soon as you step outside of that, testing becomes a whole lot more important and having, you know, uh, systems of deployment and making sure that your code is getting to the right people the, in an like, efficient manner is also very important. Um, so, you know, this is kind of, I found these, these ways of describing the difference. And you know, in prototyping, you do your development, you show somebody it, they give you some feedback, you refine it, you kind of you go through the cycle of building onto it. But um, the focus isn't necessarily on your testing or your ability to kind of deploy it or build it. So now kind of having to bring in those elements into my work is, um, has been quite interesting. And this is also coming from a space where you know, we don't have a lot of dialog code floating around. So building these, these um, ways of doing things, we're kind of having to really think about it and write new code half the time. So testing takes a lot of time, um, particularly coming from a space of you know, prototyping. And you know, it's vital, but um, making sure that you know, this production code is, has checked all the markers um, is, is vital. What I've found is having a base of code that you can trust just reduces a lot of that testing time, a lot of that energy that you go into it. So having utilities that you trust, you know, you don't want to be testing date functions every time you write a new um, piece for an application. So having these tools and libraries is a really valuable way to kind of cut down on the time you spend testing and just be more confident with your production code. Um, so Kind of my experience of having dialogue libraries is fairly limited. I think after last year, I started exploring um, Kai's APL tree, Apple tree stuff online, which was really helpful and sort of gave me ideas of how to, to sort of work in that framework. Um, but otherwise, you know, picking up scraps out of APL 2000 and converting them into dialogue to do, you know, date diff calculations or something like that. So I mean, there's two kind of libraries of sorts that are kind of in my mind, and that's accidental libraries, which I think we all have, which is you do some work, and as you move along, you kind of get snippets of code that you like, and you file them away in little groups. So for me, that would be, you know, my first project I ever got was um, IFS, an interest rate forecasting system. And I was asked to kind of add some functionality to it originally. 
and that involved a whole bunch of statistical calculations, some more forecast models, um, had to play around with some dates, so kind of as I moved through that process, this is kind of maybe 18 months ago, um, built up, you know, little utility libraries, little date handling libraries, some statistical libraries. Um, that's kind of just as I went along, you know, and then the GUI needed upgrading. We needed some flashy graphs or um, just better displays in general. And going through that, you know, learned a whole bunch about, you know, integrating with JavaScript and all sorts of other things. So kind of new code that was just generally usable in other projects kind of came out of that. Um, then kind of we decided that we don't want any GUI at all and this product would be better as a DLL that we could integrate in other places. So kind of stripping that and starting to work with object oriented programming in dialogue um, was quite useful and sort of helped focus this idea of a library and how to kind of draw code in and use code between different projects. Um, I mean, finally, kind of ending up at realizing that even DLLs isn't probably the best bet and having this product be a RESTful service using my server. That's kind of the, the evolution of this, this prototype. Um, but that's like, you know, these accidental libraries have come out of that. I've got a, a fair amount of code that's, you know, in places, but if I want to use it somewhere else, often it needs tweaking or something like that. So recently I was given the task of um, dealing with a whole bunch of financial reports. And financial reports aren't exactly the most interesting form of coding. So I mean, I had to kind of find a way of, um, you know, making it interesting. Um, I thought this was funny. So this is financial reporting in a nutshell. Um, actually doing the, creating the report out of the information, so maybe five lines of APL code. But you know, most of it is getting the data in form that you want. And the other bit is maybe sending it to Excel. So you, know, you, don't, you don't really get to spend a lot of time here, even though that's probably the most fun. So <laughs> how to, um, you know, then I had to kind of reevaluate this approach and sit down and decide I wasn't actually going to start working on, on these reports and, the, and I just focusing on a means to get data in a way that I wanted consistently and for conceivable future projects it was going to be invaluable. So that, that sort of led me to this um, import tool that I want to share with you. Um, this stuff's now on GitHub so you can find it there but um, I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, so there's database handling, some CSV handling, and um, a build tool that I want to talk about. Um, here's a little bit of code. And I, I find this very readable, as in I would put money on somebody else being able to change some of this and believe they know what it's going to do. Um, it doesn't look like APL, and in my mind that's all right, because this isn't where my work begins. You know, I just want data somewhere that I can begin to manipulate it and do the things that I need to do with it. So if this is just you know, really easy to read and kind of gets things in the right way, you know, you, instant, you create the instance of the class, send it the DSN and the name of the namespace that you want it, all the data to go into, and it's, you know, it selects out the fields from the tables. It's SQL-esque, so if you know a tiny bit of SQL, you can begin to, to use this, this class. Um, it stores the actual um, fields as APL variables that you can define the names of. The table is a um, namespace that you can define the name of. And via this, you know, particularly in the, my environment, the database is going through active changes. So if somebody decides that they want to reformat the names of the fields, it doesn't take much for me to come in here and just you know, capitalize F and N or something along those lines. So, you know, cutting down on the sort of changes that I have to make when changes in the way I, the data exists change has become like, is quite valuable. Um, there's a whole bunch of things you can do, you know, select for all, you know, store tables. You'll see over here, this is kind of what it looks like in the, the actual workspace. So you can store it as a matrix, or you can store it as a set of variables inside a namespace. Um, different advantages to each option. Um, I mean, there's other, other things you can do with this, sort of other SQL sort of operations. You can say, you know, select um, where this field is less than, equal to, or something along those lines. You can reorder your data 
um, before you actually even save it into the workspace. And I, I mean, I find this quite useful as well. You know, apply, and then you can write a little defin, um, and you can apply that to a field. So, for instance, a lot of the time, um, percentages or interest rates come through as um, in the hundreds, but you actually want them as decimals. So, quick, you know, divide by 100 can be quite useful in this instance before you even begin to work with the information. Um, what I found is, you know, the way we work as well, you know, we use CSV files for testing, and you know, I think a lot of people still use CSV files as makeshift databases. And so then this is the same sort of tool that almost looks the same as the last one that can engage with you know, um, a MySQL database or progress database. This now works with CSV files and treats them in a very similar way. So it'll search through um, a list of directories that you give it. It'll try to find the files. And then from that, you can um, pull out different fields. Or if it doesn't have a heading, you can indicate um, column numbers and then pulls those out. And you can apply the same sort of SQL-esque um, statements to, to this. Um, and again, with this, you know, in a testing phase, if you've got a set of uh, CSV files that you're using to mimic your database, so then work from this back to the, or then to move from those files to the database requires you basically just to change the name of the, the class you're using. Um, maybe one or two other things as well. And you can, you know, here we go. There's another example of what this looks like um, inside the actual workspace. Um, and you can fine tune it a bit. I found that, you know, with um, column headers and whatnot, people sometimes capitalize them or leave out a space or something or another use an underscore. So you don't have to use um, a strict match on the names. There's kind of ability to be a bit looser with you know, the file names and whatnot. You can choose you know, whether it's got a header or not. Specifying data types, kind of using the quad CSV, um, one, two, three, four methods. Um, removing empty rows or columns. So there's a bit of pre-processing you can do before you get the data into your workspace and can actually start using it. Um, second up is now the working with uh, DLLs. I found that I've had to go into this um, window over here one too many times, you know, and particularly, you know, you run an export for your own little test environment and you realize you've kind of left a stop in somewhere or something silly like that, and then you've got to go re-export it. And once you've clicked on file export one too many times in a day, you kind of get a bit fed up. So. I spoke to, I think, Vince at a dialogue, and he sent me this line of code, which sort of underpins this whole tool. It basically can um, automate the build. And the way I've kind of navigated it is one option is you can set up a little, a little INI file. Uh, it just will read that when you run the build tool, build from INI. It will read you know, a set of instructions from the INI and um, give you your build. And there's a variety of different options you can give it, you can you know, define your name, you can define you know, what the export type actually is, your max workspace. You can choose whether you actually want to save a copy of the workspace into the directory, whether you want to run a compile on all the functions before, just in case you forgot. Um, pick your logo files, select actual dialog files that you're going to need um, to make sure that everything runs. And I mean, for instance, this, this one over here will give you something like this. Um, so this has been very useful and kind of sped up working my process of working quite a bit. And it's the sort of these tools that I'm showing. Kind of, I think it's you know depending on what you're doing, everybody kind of needs to get data in, in sometimes, and everybody sort of needs to have an export at some point in their life. And having these sorts of mechanisms can really speed up your your life, and your you can get to the sort of coding that you enjoy and the parts of it that are a lot more fun. Um, so yeah, as I said, all of this is on GitHub. Actually, the build tool's not yet, because um, it needs a bit of tweaking, or we'll just want to make it a bit more user-friendly before I put it up there. But I think, yeah, it's important that we like share code as well, um, in the sense that you know, if you're programming in Python or something like that, I think people have mentioned this, it's kind of been going around since Monday morning. Um, you know, you'll, you'll go online, you'll type in, you start looking at dialog, you'll go into GitHub and type in dialog and see what, what's out there. What are the people doing in this language? What tools exist? Um, 
So I thought it was important to share. And there's no intellectual property in this. You know, it's still risk flows work because I did it on their time, a lot of it. But, um, you know, in agreement that we can post it. So it's up there. Um, and the build tool will be up there soon. Um, yeah, just some, I suppose, final words would be that this sort of um, having libraries and having access to solid code bases that can just get you to the point where you can start enjoying your work is quite important. And particularly, you know, not everybody is SimCorp with 25 million lines of code. And who, who are the people working in API now that, you know, it's, it's not viable to rewrite everything yourself. You know, if you could always choose to go to C Sharp and just get a whole bunch of libraries. So this need to have a, a solid base of um, tools so that you don't have to pick between languages just because you don't really want to go through the hassle of having to do something yourself, um, I think is quite important. Um, I think I'm a bit short of time, but uh, I'll take questions because that's actually me done. So have you started a young APL users club in Cape Town yet? <laughs> no, not yet. Although there was somebody last year as well um, from UCT. I think came second, wasn't there? Um, never met up with her, though. Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, I have a suggestion for your little language. If you make a user-defined operator called van, yep. then you could have less than without quoting it. Can you do operators in classes? I didn't think you could. I tried. Um, you, you can't make them public. Yeah. Ah, OK. Which ah. is? OK. You're not the first person to say that. Mm. I, I, yeah, I did, I did try that. Ah. Mm. <laughs> OK. Um, if I understood right, the, the application you have that's written in Dialog APL, this risk flow thing, yeah. that you put on GitHub also? Yeah. That's oh, the, not the ifs, just the, the, the data, ex data extraction tool and the build tool. OK, not, not the actual risk flow application. No, there's no risk flow work that's on GitHub. I mean, there's still concerns there, I suppose, with intellectual property. But um, yeah. Cool. No further questions. Okay, thank you very much. Easy.